2012. In the district of Schwabing, the apartment of an 80-year-old recluse called Cornelius Gurlitt is about to be raided. Little did people know that what would be found there would open up a Pandora's box involving Nazi loot, degenerate art, and Hitler's own private museum. Cornelius Gerlitz is not a name that will be familiar to many people until this year. Um, someone that lived as a recluse in Munich in a very modest flat. He's a bit of an enigma. He was a loner, but we don't really know much about him. Well, he was a very interesting man. It wouldn't be surprising if he had a slightly, uh, slightly strange upbringing and some effect from that. He wasn't seen much out and about and was someone who hasn't even watched television since 1963. He's really lived completely a, a solitary life. As the investigators poured through the collection of this solitary man, they uncovered over a thousand works by the likes of Matisse, Picasso, Chagall and Otto Dix, some of which were previously unknown. There are things we think, where did that come from? You know, where has that been for the last 60 years? Which is, you know, exactly what Cornelius Gerlitt wanted. It uh, has lived a rather pathetic, lonely life with all these pictures. I wonder if it's, uh, if it's all true. When the story was broken by Focus magazine, it captured the world's attention. Who was Cornelius Gerlitt? How had he stayed undetected for so long? And just where did all of these artworks come from? The answer to all of these questions begins in the town of Zwickau in Eastern Germany in 1930. Zwickau was the hometown of Cornelius Gerlitz's father, Hildebrand Gerlitt. He came from a well-known artistic family and worked in the galleries at the Koenig Albert Museum. Hildebrand Gerlitt was um, an art historian, a good art historian, and a dealer, and he worked for various German museums. He was known as being someone who had close links with the avant-garde art world in Germany, um, with a lot of the modern expressionist painters of the day. The first exhibition he put on was Max Pechstein, which was, you know, quite alternative at that time, um, and he did worked with artists like Kate Korvitz, a lot of the expressionists. Um, so he was seen as really quite radical, and I think you know a lot of people enjoy the exhibitions, but the kind of local traditionalists saw him as yeah this kind of radical young guy who'd come in and really shaken things up and stick out. But with the Nazis coming to power in 1933 and Hitler's hatred of the modern art movement, Hildebrand found himself out of a job in Zwickau and forced by the Nazis to resign a new position he'd found in Hamburg soon after. Hildebrand was not welcome in this new cultural era of Germany. Modern art was declared an enemy of the state and culminated in the Entarte der Kunst, or so-called Degenerate Art Exhibition of 1937. The Nazis really felt very concerned about modern art, the avant-garde in Germany at that time. I and mean, it's testament to how powerful that art is. It was a genuine worry for them. And they really wanted to outlaw it and ban it. And also use it, I think, for their own propaganda. Is if you're against our regime, you'll end up like these people. You'll be mad. You'll be completely against the norm, basically. When Hitler, in order to try and uh, focus the German nation's psyche on its future and its purity and its superiority, and he wanted to connect the German nation in his definition the best forms of art. He ordered a exhibition to be held of all this degenerate art. <laughs> So they mounted actually two exhibitions at the same time. There was one of German art, really, for the last 2,000 years. 
Then at the same time, down the road in Munich, there was the Antarctica Kunst exhibition, uh, which actually had more visitors than the other one, unsurprisingly. There was a huge exhibition held in Munich in 1937 uh, with paintings which they despised, uh, presented with slogans against modern art that which were written on the walls. And this exhibition attracted two million visitors in Munich, which is an amazing number. And it then went on to tour other German cities. Uh, but it is most unusual to hold an exhibition of art that you despise. I think a lot of um, the journalists at that time who had been closely linked to avant-garde circles found it really hard because they were under pressure to write very scornful and scathing reports about the exhibition, saying how, how horrendous all this work was. Can you imagine, you know, if somebody put on a show of sort of accepted British art now and then art you're not allowed to see, of course you go to the one you're not allowed to see, I mean, the kind of hideous art. There were many people who went to see it and many were horrified by it. It was absolute chaos in there. Everything was hung, stacked up on the walls. Paintings were lopsided. Things were propped against the wall. Some were unframed, some were framed. And they had graffiti explaining why each work was degenerate. So even if you couldn't figure it out for yourself, you were told. Whereas in the other exhibition, it was all very classical, monumental nudes uh, representing classicism and longevity, all the things that Hitler wanted to build into his Aryan race. Four times as many people went to the Generate Art Show as the, uh, as the Corso show. And, um, you know, maybe Hitler was a secret modernist, who knows? I mean, certainly he exposed more Germans to modern art than would ever have seen it if he hadn't put that show on. The Entartete Kunst Exhibition was organized by the Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, headed by Joseph Goebbels. Deutsche Männer und Frauen, das Zeitalter eines überspitzten jüdischen Intellektualismus ist nun zu Ende. And some of them went to look at it because they thought they'll never see it again. There had already been the book burnings earlier that year where they'd burnt works by many, many modern writers. Um, so really it was a, maybe a death knell to those avant-garde artists and their work. So a lot of people who were sympathised went um, at the same time as a lot of people going just to have a kind of scoff and laugh at it. There were several reasons why the Nazis despised so-called degenerate art. Um, Hitler himself personally was very, very conventional in his artistic taste and disliked modern art. Some of the artists um, who made the modern art, like Chagall, for example, uh, were Jewish and uh, the Nazis obviously despised them for that reason. And there was also a very strong streak of conventionality in Nazi thought. They espoused old-fashioned traditional values, and modern art seemed to just run counter to that. The era of degenerate art may have ended Hildebrand Gerlitz's promising early career, but he had even more pressing concerns. He did have kind of Jewish blood in him, which would have made him slightly vulnerable to the Nazis. He was what they called a second second level Michelin, wasn't he? So I mean, he was a quarter Jewish. It was probably better to play along. Hildebrand's heritage and his love of modernism would have seemingly ended any chance of a career in the art business. But amazingly, he was hired by the Nazis to work as a dealer on behalf of the state. When the Nazis were getting rid of degenerate art, he was singled out as one of a handful of major dealers who were entrusted with the task of selling off the art. So that's where he got quite a lot of his pictures, and he was quite interested in modern art. He was able to ingratiate himself with the Nazis because of his understanding of the whole of the Jewish and other collectors of, of that current generation of art, and become one of the main individuals who helped them loot art around Europe. He went on to work with the Nazis as one of four dealers who were charged with basically making some money out of the modernist or degenerate art as they saw it. I think there's a quote that says something like, we've got to make some money out of this rubbish. So they just wanted to get it out of Germany and sell it off um, and get foreign currency in as well. He would argue that he'd saved some of the art by um, selling it off to foreign collectors rather than allowing the Nazis to destroy it. Hildebrand had a talent for gaining access to artworks and he was soon buying pieces directly from those who had to sell as they were being persecuted or were forced to flee the country. 
This is my offer for all nine of the drawings. It is a fair offer, I believe. Good, good. I'll arrange collection, handle all the details. It's very difficult to get inside the minds of people and uh, um, it was a very difficult period and people did things uh, that we would now regard as wrong in many cases. The art will be safe at least. It is the art that you're saving. Yes, of course. They've already dismissed me from my gallery. If they think I'm offering generous terms, I, I have a family. I'm a quarter Jewish. One doesn't know precisely why he dealt with uh, the Nazis, but uh, the most obvious reason is that it was a way of making money. This was a very comfortable, easy life that got him out of uh, all the problems of the rest of the war. And the money must have been extremely good at a time when, unless you were in the armaments business, it was very difficult to make any money. I'll send, from, I'll send my man for, for the paintings this afternoon. Doctor? Hildebrand Gerlitt would soon become one of the biggest dealers on behalf of the Nazis. The choice he had made would take him to Paris, where his mission was to acquire works for the Führer's own personal collection from Nazi-occupied France. The 2012 Munich Artworks discovery had thrown light on the life and career of the man who had acquired the collection, one Hildebrand Gerlitt. He had started out as a respected museum director, but with the Nazis coming to power, he became a key part of the commission for the exploitation of degenerate art. Works were bought directly from those being persecuted and were seized for the Entartete Kunst exhibition. Hildebrand was able to build up his own collection as he worked to sell these so-called degenerate art pieces abroad, from where they were stored in the Schoenhausen Palace near Berlin. In the process, he was able to hoard many works for himself. This is how a number of paintings by the German artist Otto Dix, who featured heavily in the degenerate art exhibition, wound up in Cornelius Gerlitz's apartment in Munich. Otto Dix was heavily featured. Obviously his work is quite shocking visually, very caricatured. People saw it as really horrifying, couldn't understand why he would choose to represent the human figure and face in that way. During the First World War, Dix was very shocked by what he saw and a lot of his pictures show the savagery of the fighting. And the Nazis despised his paintings as degenerate and he was categorised as such. But another artist that was Interestingly, very vilified was Emil Nolder, who actually had been a member of the Nazi party and a real sympathizer from quite early on. But he was the artist that had the most works of any of them, had 27 works featured in the exhibition. And he was the one that had said, you know, I am a Nazi sympathizer, I stand up for what you believe in. And there's a very sad story about him, he was very elderly going to, after the exhibition, going to the authorities and saying, you know, I'm, I'm a sympathizer, please can you release my work? And they refused and he had very important crucifixion work which they wouldn't give him back, despite his allegiance to the party. The label degenerate even applied to music, with an Intartata music exhibition also being staged. It was a bizarre and terrifying time for anyone working in the arts in Germany, and Hildebrand Gerlitt was caught right up in the middle of it. I think we all want to see the kind of Nazi epoch in terms of black and white, and I think a lot of people were both black and white, and certainly before the war, he was incredibly white. He was passionate about modernism. And then the next thing you know, he's in Paris <laughs> expropriating art from Paul Rosenberg and, and the Rothschilds and, you know, doing, doing rather kind of dreadful things. It was in Paris that Hildebrand took full advantage of his new position of power. The Entartete Kunst exhibition had made some of the best modern expressionist paintings available. 
But with the Nazis having taken control of France, some of the greatest art of the era was within reach. Paris has always been an important centre of the art market, particularly in the 20th century. So it's no surprise that a German dealer would have very good and close contacts with Paris and spend time there. The best art of all belonged to Paul Rosenberg. He'd managed to escape just in time, but the same could not be said for his whole collection. He's an incredibly important dealer and came from a family of dealers, so he really had it in his lineage. And he was most famously Picasso's dealer from 1918 to 1940. He and Picasso were like sort of family, weren't they? They, um, they lived next door to each other and they spent holidays together and it was, you know, um, it was a love thing. He was also a dealer for Matisse from 1936. So he really had the big names and his gallery was on Rue La Boétie and it was really known as the kind of hub in Paris of these modern artists that were breaking the mold. You could find them all there with Paul Rosenberg. Rosenberg was one of the most important dealers, particularly in modernist works, um, the post-impressionist, early 20th century works. He was among the most important dealers for that period. Well, he was kind of Mr. Cubism, really, wasn't he? He, um, he and his brother Léonce were the big um, sellers of, of mid-period Cubism, and they internationalized it, and they, um, you know, they opened a, a gallery in London, a gallery in New York, and they sold museum modern art, and were, you know, had massive collections and were massively rich. When things became more tense in Europe, he started to get nervous and did ship off a lot of his collection, which was very, very extensive. So it was went to South America, Australia, and also to London and New York, his galleries. But unfortunately, he didn't get everything out. And in 1940, he fled to New York, managed to get a visa, got his family out very quickly. But there were, I think, over 2,000 works left. Paul Rosenberg's confiscated collection, along with all other art labeled degenerate in France, was stored at the Jeux de Paume Gallery in Paris. Hildebrand Gerlit was then able to purchase these works at knockdown prices at the nearby Drouot auction house. Many sales were made at the Drouot auction house, and that continued during the Second World War. And it was a place to trade in the work of the Impressionists, in post-Impressionists. Between 1941 and 1945, while Gerlit was living and working in Paris, he was able to add top quality paintings to his already impressive collection. But as the tide of the war turned against Germany, he needed to find a way to keep them for himself. As chaos reigned towards the end of the war, from about the early 1944 period, when it was clear that the war was lost and the Russians were approaching, there were a lot of people who spent most of their time thinking about how they're going to survive at the end of the war. And for somebody like him in a very privileged position to move art to secret locations where he could say he was trying to sell it for the Nazis, but actually he was keeping it for himself at the end of the war. Having noted the warning signs, Hildebrand Gerlit moved swiftly and managed to relocate much of his art collection away from his home in Dresden. They were kept on a farm outside Dresden and then they were in some sort of nameless castle in some nameless town in nameless southern Germany. It doesn't seem to me a collection that was put together with love. You know, it seems a kind of expedient collection. It looks like the kind of collection that was designed to be sold quietly not raise too many eyebrows. It was fortunate that Hildebrand was able to get the works away from the city of Dresden, given what was about to happen.
approaching, the firebombing of Dresden provided him with an ideal cover story. We well, had a home in Dresden, um, and actually his street was bombed, so I think Hildebrand saw it as a very obvious and clear solution to their hoard. I think they just said, you know, our street was bombed, all the records have gone, all the art's gone, we don't have anything, we have no letters, we've got nothing. And it made complete sense because it was actually bombed and no one knew that I think Hildebrand had actually taken the art out in the very, very last minute when the Allies were approaching. So there was no reason really why it wouldn't be true that it was bombed. Hildebrand Gerlit had another secret though. He had been hired to find works of art for Hitler himself and in the process had greatly expanded his own collection. His pretense that it had all been destroyed in Dresden was successful. For over half a century, the hoard was considered lost to the world. And it would have remained so had his son Cornelius not tried to sell one of his paintings just a couple of years ago. A sale that would see the net begin to close in on this 60-year-old crime. The firebombing of Dresden could have wiped out most of the artworks found in Cornelius Gerlitz's Munich apartment in 2012. But his father, Hildebrand Gerlitz, had been smart enough to transport his collection of over a thousand works away from the city. When World War II came to an end, Hildebrand had managed to get away with storing these artworks in a secret location, thought to be on the outskirts of Dresden. He was able to return to his pre-war career in the art market, but died suddenly in a car crash in 1956. His son Cornelius then succeeded in moving the cache of works into the Schwabing apartment in 1960. They remained here for over 50 years, where every night Cornelius would take the paintings out of storage to admire them. Well, it does seem that he just inherited the pictures. The son enjoyed them um, privately and would look at them and saw no reason why he should sell them or do anything with them. So uh, the status quo continued and he just took over his father's picture collection. Anybody who is the son of somebody with as extraordinary a career as his father and the constant moves and uh, times that his father was under suspicion and worked for both the Nazis and the Allies, he must have known that his father had been playing both sides of the street. And that may well, I think, have set up various tensions within him. Cornelius had remained hidden from society for all this time. But with no state health insurance in his old age, he was forced to enter the art market himself and sell one of his paintings for much needed funds. Spending so much time alone, Cornelius was known to write what he intended to say on cue cards when faced with a conversation. Good afternoon. This is the painting that I wish to sell. Good afternoon. This is the painting that I wish to sell. Cornelius Gerlitt decided to part with this important work by Max Beckman, The Lion Tamer, because he was getting increasingly ill. And I think really out of desperation, he just decided to sell one uh, via an auction house in Cologne. The auction house sent a representative as they do to come and do a valuation. And uh, she came in expecting, I'm not sure what, and to a very gloomy, dark flat. Mr. Gurlitt, I'm Ms. Balman from the auction house. We spoke on the phone. Yes. Come in. She had no uh, inkling of what else was hiding in that flat. How did you come by it? Was it in your family? My mother's. You don't have any more then? No, this is the only one. This is the painting that I wish to sell. Well, when it was taken to the German auction house, Lempertz, uh, it was very clearly in the provenance 
his father's name was up in lights and his father's name is on our red flag list. Any picture we see anywhere in the world with his name, we undertake extensive research. So it would have been immediately obvious to Lempertz that this picture was claimed by the family uh, of the victims of the original persecution. And so the normal thing then is to contact the family and to say to them, this picture's coming up for sale, and there is a deal that could be done whereby you should get some of the proceeds. Whether they knew at the time the exact circumstances under which he'd held it is probably doubtful. They probably thought he'd got it in possibly good faith. That's highly debatable now, I think. He made an arrangement uh, with the heirs of the pre-war owner, so they agreed to split um, the proceeds, and it just went on the market as a normal picture and wasn't particularly closely examined. I would like to know what was in the collection in 1956, um, before Hildebrand died, and how much of that has been sold off quietly in the intervening years. But by selling the lion tamer, Cornelius had started the process that would lead to his eventual downfall. He was merely following the example of his father Hildebrand, though, who had been expected to generate funds by selling modern paintings. But he also had another major role, to purchase or otherwise acquire works for the Führer himself. Hitler had grand plans for his own purpose-built Führer Museum in his hometown of Linz, and he needed the greatest works in history to fit it. His desire to make a mark in the art world had started from a very young age, when he first moved to Vienna in 1905. When he was young, Hitler wanted to become an artist, and he applied uh, to study at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna and was turned down twice. He was rejected straight out without even interview, so he really got a slap in the face from that. He felt uh, rejected um, at a crucial point in his career. I think that made him uh, dislike the art establishment, and by this time, the art establishment had been seen as supporting the development of modern and 20th century art. He does believe that there is a kind of cons a, a world conspiracy, not specifically against him, but about people against people like him, people with his kind of taste. And it's these nasty, interchangeable, <laughs> sort of deranged Jewish Bolshevik uh, folk who like that kind of painting. Vienna, at the start of the early 20th century, was the home of a bustling new artistic community that Hitler simply did not fit into. In Vienna, there was no doubt there was a very libertarian, rather degenerate feeling to the city. And it's quite clear that in Vienna at the time, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was, was, was falling to bits. I think it's, it's what had happened in Paris sort of 25 years before. Was you had a kind of imperial heavy hand um, suddenly, um, in the case of the French, was lifted by Napoleon III being got rid of. In, in Vienna, it was just, you know, poor old Franz Josef had been there for 50 years by that time. And I think also it was the city of Sigmund Freud, because one thing that all of these things have in common is, is kind of psychic introspection um, and a kind of an idea of the possibility of madness. Um, and that, of course, went down like a cup of cold sick with the Nazis. They didn't like that sort of thing at all. I think in Vienna was what was incredible was a real mix of all the different arts, as it were. So there was the birth of atonal music happened in Vienna. You had a new psychological study from Freud. You had artists like Klimt and then the next generation following him, showing an emotional response to art that was about the internal rather than the external. So it was coming from all directions. It was music, it was theatre, it was literature, it was art. It was a real sort of hotbed for this new avant-garde, a new way of seeing and thinking. There was some great work done in mathematics and science. Uh, there was some great work done in psychology, but you can see a lot of people would have felt that that was all pretty strange and a bit unsettling. Uh, and there was some, in many ways, great art, but what would be to them, and even now, rather shocking in some ways. It was very exciting, the early 20th century in Vienna. I mean, culturally, there were a lot of avant-garde artists who were really pushing the boundaries. In Vienna, at the time when Hitler was living there in the early 20th century, there was quite a conflict between um, the avant-garde and the traditional art, which uh, was the art that Hitler espoused. 
Hitler's traditional style, which included watercolors and drab sketches of the sights of Vienna, were not going to cut it in this new modern art scene. But his enormous political success allowed Hitler to finally fulfill his artistic ambitions with the construction of the Führer Museum in his country of birth, Austria. The Führer Museum was going to be in Austria and Linz, which was the hometown of Hitler, and he really wanted to construct this enormous pantheon of the culture of the New Reich. It would be an art museum, but not only that, a library, opera house, theatre, everything to do with his new imposed culture would be here in this enormous great symbol of his power. He's not the only man, he's not the only megalomaniac man who has seen that a museum is maybe the best way to have your, your name set for posterity. As ambitious as the Führer Museum was on its own, it was actually only a part of the grand restructuring of the entire city of Linz. Really quite early on in 1936, he had already spoken to his head architect at that time. It was going to be 500 feet long, you know, Arbitsphere, lots and lots and lots of columns, peristyles, um, all the usual Nazi claptrap. He poured over the plans, poured over what works he wanted to get, and then he went on a really a rampage across the countries that they're invading, taking works from Jewish families, from museums. A lot of religious art was taken from churches even in Germany and stored them at that time, ready for the Führer Museums. And it was a kind of degree of thought that went into it because it was, you know, it was going to be the Central Museum of the Reich. It was going to have a collection that effectively showed the whole course of art history leading to Germany. Every single masterpiece from right across time would be housed here in that museum. And people were going to come from all over the Reich to Linz to see it. So there was also the Adolf Hitler Hotel as part of the complex, because of course they would have to have somewhere to stay when they got there. One of the people entrusted with acquiring works for this audacious museum was Hildebrand Gerlitt. During his time in Paris, Gerlitt was a big time buyer who acquired major works. He even spent five million francs on a Cezanne landscape painting of the Vallée de l'Arc which later proved to be a fake. But he wasn't alone in trying to acquire works for Hitler. Dr. Hans Posse, a close confidant of the Führer, was tasked with seizing the most challenging paintings to obtain, including works by Johannes Vermeer. Hitler's taste ran mostly to German and Austrian romantic 19th century art, so he, I, I imagine there would have been lots of um, Caspar David Friedrich and that sort of stuff. But the chap who was buying for him was a, was a great expert in, in Netherlandish and Flemish art. So, I mean, there was, you know, there were two Vermeers, for example, I and mean, there were going to be lots and lots of the old Michelangelo, you know, big stuff. If you're going to found a museum, you've got to have, if it's going to be the great pictures of the world, some of the great Dutch and Italian masters. There were two masterpieces by Vermeer which were destined for the Führer Museum. Uh, one of which was bought and one of which was stolen. Now the bought one was called the Artist Studio, very, very important work by Vermeer. And Hitler actually bought that directly from Count Zernan himself for quite a lot of money, but his descendants are now contesting. It's still a case that's, that's going on as we speak. The other was stolen from the Rothschild family as part of the hoard taken from them. The Führer Museum, along with other grand schemes for the reconstruction of Linz, never got past the design stage. But many artworks had already been acquired, ready to be moved in. They had been stored in Munich, but with the threat of bombing, the hall was moved for safekeeping to a salt mine in the Austrian region of Altersee. They were boxed up, sent there, and no one really knew much else about it. When the war in Europe came to an end, the Allies managed to track down the salt mine in Altersee. Inside, they were able to recover both the astronomer and the artist's studio. They also managed to reclaim a stolen bust by Michelangelo and the priceless Ghent altarpiece, all of which were taken in preparation for the Führer Museum. The Ghent altarpiece was a, um, a seminal work, I think that's the right expression, by the Van Eyck's, and it, it set a, a, a tone and a procedure for things that makes it historically enormously important. But I think perhaps the most valuable painting taken during the war were those various Vermeers that were stolen you know, individually. Even for Hitler, getting hold of Vermeers and 
pictures of that quality, not easy. I mean, it's just really very fortunate that those were not destroyed. I mean, there were quite a lot of very good pictures, which we're pretty certain were destroyed, uh, i.e. there's records of where they were, and it's known that that place was uh, bombed or damaged or flooded or whatever, uh, and uh, the pictures were destroyed. Just as Hitler's secret hoard had been recovered at the end of the war, time was running out for Cornelius Gerlitz's stash in his Munich apartment. And a trip to Switzerland would prove to be his final undoing. Until 2010, Cornelius Gerlitz's remarkable cache of over 1,400 artworks was still unknown to the world. He had managed to successfully sell the Lion Tamer painting by Max Beckman for quick funds. But his luck started to run out when he was stopped at a customs point on a train from Switzerland. Well, Gerlitz was on a train and uh, from Z Zurich uh, to Munich and uh, he was stopped by German customs officials who were just doing, we believe, just doing routine checks. And he was found to have a substantial amount of cash with him. He had on him and 9,000 euros, which is just under the limit of what you have to declare coming out of Switzerland. This was a train from Zurich to Munich. And then they looked for his identity papers and this, that and the other, and he appeared to be a rather strange individual. Hence, the Germans then raided his flat. He had no tax um, references, no health insurance. He's someone who's been kind of completely off the radar of the German authorities. So they were quite surprised to find him with this huge loot. I mean, I think, you know, they thought, why is this old man carrying 9,000 euros from Switzerland? As I say, it's an entirely legal thing to do, but I suppose it raised questions. I must have flagged him up on some horrible tax database somewhere. I would not be at all surprised if in fact his name was on the list of those individuals who had German, Germans with bank accounts in Switzerland. There have been some whistleblowers in the Swiss banks who gave these lists of names to the American and German intelligence services. So I wonder whether in fact they hadn't spotted him as it were from one of those lists. When will you bring them back? Finding 1,400 works of art in Germany is just the start of the treasure hunt. The cramped London offices of the Art Loss Register have been besieged ever since German prosecutors announced the discovery of works by masters such as Marc Chagall, Henri Matisse and Pablo Picasso. The race is now on to find the rightful owners. Well, what is unusual is the sheer size of the collection, um, 1,400 um, pictures and drawings. Ranging from works on paper right through to oil paintings. It's got a lot of the German expressionists in there, people like Emil Knowles, Max Pechstein, um, right through to Picasso's, Matisse's. Um, so it's really quite broad and it's said to um, be of value over a billion euros. It's slightly unfortunate the whole thing was kept very quiet for about a year or so, and it only emerged later when a German magazine discovered what had happened and published the story that it came out. And I say it's important to come out, but if there are claimants for the pictures, um, it's important that they're all uh, recorded um, publicly so we know what's out there. At least one of the works found in the Munich apartment, a Matisse painting of a seated woman, is thought to have belonged to Paul Rosenberg. There's been a lot of criticism on the case that there haven't been so uh, very detailed inventory released, which is against the established policy of how you should deal with stolen art. And the family of Paul Rosenberg are already questioning whether this is their seated woman. The recovery process of Paul Rosenberg's stolen paintings has been long and arduous. It started right at the end of World War II with Rosenberg's son. Lieutenant Rosenberg was the son of Paul Rosenberg, who was the Parisian dealer who went fled to New York uh, at the start of the war 
who had been the, um, the dealer for all these great Matisse and Picasso and people like that. And he found some of his father's pictures and as well as all the other things. And it's fascinating. I mean, there's still 70 Picassos missing, aren't there, in the world um, from the war. And lots of Paul Rosenberg's collection is still unaccounted for. But that's a separate part of history because then Paul Rosenberg's granddaughter is Anne Sinclair. She's a wonderful lady and she's pursuing the pictures in her own way through the courts and is, is actively involved in that at the moment. So you can see this evolution of how the stolen art um, is, is, is recovered if it belongs to Anne Sinclair and her family, the descendants of Paul Rosenberg, then I, I think they have every right to make a claim for it. However, just six months after his story was revealed to the world, Cornelius Gurlitt passed away following ill health after heart surgery. During that time, it was discovered that he held even further paintings in two properties he owned in Austria. These included works by Renoir and Monet. In a surprising twist, though, the Bern Museum of Fine Arts revealed that they'd been named the sole heir of Cornelius Gerlitz's collection, despite him having had no connection to the institution during his lifetime. But the restitution process of many of the works in the collection could continue for a long time. It's extremely complex working with restitution, tracing back and uh, trying to figure out who actually owns these paintings and in what circumstances they went from the family or owner pre-war and into the hands of Hildebrand Gerlitz. So it's going to be a lot of research, very detailed, and who knows how long it's going to take and, and actually if we'll ever know the full history and provenance of every single work. Well, I think one of the lessons is, of this is that um, uh, the art trade has to be more open and um, people buying at auction have to ask more questions about the works. This is happening more now and there's been increasing focus in the last 10 years on provenance. Um, but I think the Gerlich case shows the importance of monitoring it carefully and people asking questions. By and large, the rule of thumb, so far as right and wrong is concerned, if the Nazis have had anything to do with any art deal between the mid-30s and 1946, they must always lose. It's a, it's a principle. It's not a, anybody's law or anything like that. It's just a kind of modern principle, which I agree with. So, could there be any more Cornelius Gerlitz out there with hidden masterpieces just waiting to be found? To get well into the 21st century and for these things still to be coming up is quite a you know, quite an eye-opener. I don't think they're going to be everywhere. I think it's probably a very rare case. There are quite a lot of people who've got the odd work or two, but, but something of this scale has not emerged in uh, many, many years. I think it's unlikely there are many people who've got something of that size stashed away secretly. I think this is a real one-off, and the fact that he was such a reclusive character made this possible, but it's certainly not going to be something that happens every day. It will probably take years to sort out the pictures and what category they fall into and whether any were looted. And the whole saga will take a long time to resolve.